Hi, I'm Nadia, an actor, poet and theatre maker from Scarborough. A few weeks ago the SJT got in touch and asked if I wanted to be involved in their summer school. This is what I made. So my name is Otis Mensa. Um, I'm a hip hop artist and uh, I guess a spoken word poet. I'm the poet laureate of Sheffield, or, or for the for the time being. Um, so yeah, uh, those 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 are sort of uh, things that I relate to. However, yeah, first and foremost, a hip hop artist. The world needs poets because there needs to be um, there needs to be a collective of of people. There needs to be think tanks of people that are willing to. Uh, be un unwavered um, in the face of social conditioning and social norms and be willing to step up against uh, you know systems of oppression whether that's white supremacy whether that's uh, patriarchy and be willing to talk out about that now I think some of the best work is when an artist use their, uses their own experience vulnerable experience to do that to dismantle those systems you allow people to to start their process of transformation within themselves um, and especially if you're uh, an informed poet. So poetry is, uh, poetry is important um, if poetry is, is defined as um, people who are willing to be honest and vulnerable but also um, free thinking outside the system. I had a dream I went to see The Roots. The atmosphere was electric. Questlove played an eternal break of undoubted flavour to call out Black Thought who rushed the stage like a floating spirit both hurrying and taking time in one. Tariq was draped down in a black silk cloak that covered the whole stage. The cape of sorts was embroidered with red lines that ran parallel throughout the cloth, like the blood vessels of midnight streets in Philadelphia, and his cadence embodied revolution. Like the dreams of my youth, when in sleep I sought out the validation of favoured artists, I woke myself up with a croaked inner voice proclaiming, I need that. <laughs> I was speaking of the cape. If only I could wear its skin like my own and feel what it feels to be the sound of reverence and just rest, rest in it. The poems that I performed uh, for this film are from a, a, my debut poetry collection called Save Metamorphosis. And um, yeah, the poems sort of center around this theme of transformation, this theme of change. And I guess more specifically, change that we socially normalize as um, maybe as teenagers or, or as young adults you know perhaps uh, transformations such as um, leaving school or you know leaving a friend who you've who you've lived with for, for many years you know these big huge identity building states that were sort of hurtled from or ripped apart from I wanted to focus in on the perhaps the unspoken trauma that that causes and, and the impact that that has on, on our psyche. Touch ground like a new man. <laughs> old friend full of old demons. Not sure I can exercise them. Head down at a cold zenith. Not sure that I know myself, but assured you don't know me either. Yet you're surprised at that advice that you comprise depleted. I can't surmise that all the words that leave your lips aren't lies And I can see myself inside the things I've criticised Living life on a lonely edge No friends trying to talk me down My delusions of grandeur expand until they break my body bound Purpose is a hobby cloud Gripe shy as I groan and frown I'd love to roll around but I'm on the edge Burnt to the marrow mess My choice is as narrow as death I'd love to wallow away less Over sorrow, dead morals and stress I barely ponder at most I'd like to visit the coast Write novels on hollow post modern distress Man shakes in the cold street Ask me for some spare change I said pray tell I've seen myself through better days I proclaimed that I had nothing Implying that I've got something Cause nothing is freedom to think And that's a victor's trumpet there's a child in every adult commuting. The imposter in the mirror is grueling. Every dream takes me closer to wiser. But every dream is just a dream that is fleeting. Uh, so my advice to people who are starting their poetic journey as a creative um, would be to never pressurize yourself under the 
under the, I, I guess, the, the tyranny of, of what it means to be a productive creative, this idea that you've got, to get, you've got to wake up at the crack of dawn and write your soul's content and, you know, it's, it's, it, you, you've got to publish your first book by the time you're 18, etc., etc. I feel it's all redundant and it all sort of feeds into the greater narrative of capitalistic meritocracy and, and the rat race of productivity. I think r realistically what, like, what we can do as poets um, to have a sort of integrity filled poetic journey and creative journey is give our, our ideas the, the space and the time that they need to grow and develop, you know? And I think that means thinking a little bit outside of um, societal pressures. Um, being honest to oneself, being as authentic as you can, and when I say that I mean true to yourself, trying to connect, trying to align what you're sharing with what you're truly feeling. And then share your poetry as much as you possibly can, you know, feel that um, tangible exchange of emotion that happens between an audience and a poet or a poet and another poet, because I feel that that's an experience that's truly transformative. So I'm just going to ask you a few questions about like your process and you as a poet in general and yeah, we'll just go from there. Uh, can you start with telling us who you are, what you do and where you're based? Okay, yeah, um, so I'm Hayley Green. I'm a spoken word poet um, and workshop facilitator and I'm originally from Nottingham but I'm currently based in Scarborough. So what got you interested in poetry? I used to struggle a lot with uh, my mental health um, and I used to self-harm and uh, I used to speak to this teacher a lot about my mental health and everything that was going on um, and she told me to just go home and try and write it down so <laughs> I went home and got a book out and tried to write it like a diary so it started like dear diary um, but I just couldn't do it and then I did write something and it just ended up rhyming and becoming poetry um, and so that was sort of my way of getting all my feelings out. Um, so I just continued doing that to help me um, kind of get through difficult time. Um, I got into performing and learned how to kind of not, like my poems used to be really rubbish. So it taught me to kind of like hone my skills and create good poetry <laughs> uh, and how to perform it. So uh, that's how I got into it. Like how would you describe your work now? As I started performing and learning how to kind of use different poetry techniques and different poetry skills and um, you know a lot of people started saying how much it was helping them and um, like to hear my stuff and it kind of I kind of created it kind of went from creating this thing for me just to get my emotions out and um, to becoming to creating it to make it accessible for other people can you tell us a bit about the poems that you've decided to choose for this project? I can. Um, so I've chosen two poems. One is called Playtime uh, and one is called Changing Rooms. So Playtime was actually written first. Um, we did a workshop a while back on Sestinas, um, which is a very, very difficult poetry form I won't try and go into kind of explaining it um, but do look it up because uh, they're amazing but they're really difficult to write uh, so it's essentially you sort of use the same words and you repeat them over and over again um, and, and it kind of makes something new. I'm 12. I am cemented in a changing room. There are girls tiled on both sides and I don't know where to look. I'm taking first spot behind the showers. Don't look, don't look. I clam up. Makeup dolls and curiosity making me want to stare, but I divert my eyes to the floor and try to avoid their glares. Pop away your tongue. I'm not a lollipop. And this is not a sweet shop. She spent 10 minutes studying her timetable this morning. P.E. The two letters alphabet spaghetti around the blue and white stripes of her school planner. Her heart overcooked soup in her chest that hasn't heard from puberty. Unlike these other girls around her, she is yet to develop breasts. So I take a peek. More out of jealousy. Ugh! What are you looking at, Lesbo? Ugh, she's looking at me. She's dirty. Reverse. I took the peek back inside my head and gawk at the floor again. If I look up, they're just going to call me a lesbian. She's an odd sock. Stale. 
permeated by the words she imagines they say, which wouldn't be so unfounded. I mean, she's pounded urges so they don't surge through the edges of her skin, molded thoughts to keep within parameters of a world she doesn't understand, catting her back against tiles. I camouflage myself into the background. Towel tiles around my body, plaster myself into hiding spaces where no hiding spaces are found. She displaces the feelings tumble drying in her stomach and irons them onto others she's stained. Like the tiles on the walls around her, mosaic in her design to look more like theirs is the change. They should be put with the boys so they can't see us. They're more like them anyway. She's not been sewn together quite right. A knitted jumper with one sleeve longer than the other, still stitching threads onto the right places. And the door that separates the boys from the girls is open for me to gun so towards them through because their bodies match mine more than the girls do. It's not right that we have to hide so they can't see us. They're always looking, looking, looking. They, they must have caught me looking to get caught she must have been looking so maybe it's time she stops tucking these feelings under the desk unfold herself to reveal she's just not like them it's fine to have these thoughts in your head but i am 12. i am cemented in a changing room there are girls tiled on both sides and I don't know where to look. Is there any advice that you would give to people who maybe wanted to start out writing poetry? Read poetry. That's the one main thing I was always taught. Um, you know, in order to write, you've got to read because that's where you get your inspiration from. Um, and just be brave enough to do it. You know, there are a lot of walls that as people and as individuals we put around us and poetry can really help you break down those walls. Um, and it is scary and it, and it might feel wrong at times, but you just have to you just have to keep going. So how did you move from being involved with Maori poets and writing for like your own kind of therapeutic experience to actually like making a living? I mean, I've got to say it was all down to the Maori poets. Um, which is why I say, you know, if you can find a collective, which I'm hoping to start one in Scarborough, so look out for that. <laughs> um, if you can find like a collective of people um, to do it with, that's that's really helpful. Um, the experiences that I personally got through Malfi um, and through being in that collection, the collective, uh, sorry, were you know, I don't think I would have ever have got those experiences if I hadn't, and the opportunities. Um, so I kind of, I took everything that was offered to me. I was once a boy, or I wanted to be, or I was a boy's toy, a battered AK-47, plastic bullets pouting my body, revealing within me the girl. My mother dressed me as a girl. Football let me be a boy. I'd try to break my body, carving how I wanted to be, like, like a Ken doll. Plastic. Bones don't snap like toys. I'd reshape changeable toys, make the boys girls, give them boobs of plastic and make the girls boys. Dress them in clothes I wanted to be wearing, but my brother's clothes fell off my body. I scarred my body. My skeleton was a toy. They told me how I should be, how I should be a girl for those testosterone pumped boys, firing bullets into me, no longer plastic. I wished my bones were plastic so that I could break my body and glue it back together as a boy. So I didn't have to be their toy. So I didn't have to be a girl, just me who I wanted to be. I'm now who I want to be. No longer manipulating anatomies from plastic. I'm just in love with a girl and her effortlessly sensual body, the antithesis of toy. 
I never wanted to be a boy. Carved like a toy from plastic or a plastic girl molded from a boy's interpretation of the body of a girl. Can you tell everybody who you are, what you do and where you're based? My name is Nima Talagani. I do acting, I do some writing and I do some workshop running and mentoring. And I'm based in London town. So what got you interested in poetry? Um, I think what got me interested in poetry was just listening to rap music from when I was young. And I used to, I used to get, I remember, it was, I remember one of the albums was the Eminem show that I had when I was really like, maybe like eight, nine years old or something. I had this album and I used to read the, it had a lyrics book that came with the album. I don't know if albums still do, I imagine they still do. And it was written like in his handwriting. And I used to read that at bedtime. So instead of like reading a bedtime story, I used to do that and just become fascinated about how he would like bend words and, you know, and, and, and create rhymes and just go off on one. Um, so I think that's probably when I first started and then I listened to 50 Cent. If I'm being honest, I probably wouldn't even, even describe it as like my work. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I just like sometimes write raps and then sometimes use them for certain stuff. Um, it's like, I've, like I might have written a rap for a play and then write a rap for a certain project or write raps for stuff that I might be working on and devising myself. But won't be like, you know, my work. <laughs> it's just whenever it seems useful and appropriate. If I wrapped my Shakespeare exam when I was at university, just whenever like okay. it's a, there's a opportunity to do it, but not for the sake of it, it seems like, oh, this, this could be the way that I could express these things that are in my mind. Um, but this is the best way I can express it. There is a gigantic door for this city. There is no key to open it. There are crystals and emeralds embedded in the door's handle. There are soldiers still patrolling it. There is a gigantic door for this city. It's been here since the beginning of time. It wears bullet holes as battle scars. Its height is taller than all of us combined. There is a gigantic door for this city. They say it cannot be scaled. In order to try, you'd have to be naive and watch as your dreams are derailed. There is a gigantic door for this city where the bad things like to control and terrorize. But I heard that the bad things ran the last time they saw a room full of the brave and naive, they were terrified. The door for this city is so gigantic, they say its height is limitless. I wonder if anyone here would dare to scale it. You'll be recognised from the vandal paint upon your fingertips. You are so, so welcome to make the climb, though it can't be achieved on your ones. So if you don't feel brave enough to make the climb, then grab someone who does. Or you could build your own entrance. It might not even be a door. It may bear no resemblance to what has come before. It might just be a symbol that lets you know we're here. It might even be a welcome. It could even be sincere. If you ask the people in charge, they might say the sky is a place you can't go. The same people might steal away your future and blame it on an avocado, and yet we keep shining. They talk finance, education, nine grand, protecting this island. Youngsters flying with their left wings, what sapping with their right hands. Too much freedom, too much sex, not enough studying, too much text, too many hoodies, too much rap, too many selfies, not enough cash. Now if you do make a whole load of cash, and you're too much about money, not enough about books, obsessed with looks instead of looking up to leaders, they're looking up to crooks. And yet we keep shining. I heard the planet's a bit mashed up. They say it's getting so warm. Maybe we could freeze it all in time before our ghosts warm. Maybe the frost will bring us together, seeing as we are cold born. Cause when snowflakes assemble, they make a freaking snowstorm. No structure, no set, no template, no form. New structure, reset, tempt fate and reform. Reimagine, represent, realize and reborn. Redefine the whole freaking thing as the sky's torn. You could have all gone to war to fight for what is true. You can emulate what's gone before, that's proven to be a mighty thing to do. Or you could shake the floor, plant a punch and see what might be grew and be part of something beautiful, be part of something new. So why do you think that the world needs rap or poetry or spoken word? I think it's very important because I think it's historically like protest music. And it's also important because I think the people who do it, who perform it and who love it and who cherish it and the cultures and communities that it's part of tend to be marginalised, tend to be looked down upon and it tends to be seen as like a lower art form. Um, 
and it tends to be seen as something that promotes bad things whereas there's a lot of artists and creatives that actively promote terrible things through their music or through their work but it's just not seen in the same way um but i think it's i think it's like sort of like that kind of like in a way the highest art like if you watch rap battles it is mind-blowing the artistic like integrity and versatility and intelligence in a in like a in a high high quality rap battle it's like nothing i've ever seen before any advice that i would say is for anyone who enjoys it is just to trust your voice and to if there's something that you cherish that you enjoy and feels organic and natural um don't feel like because it might not be heralded as some of the loftier art forms that that you shouldn't do it i think if this is the way that you express yourself then ride it till the wheels fall off and know that don't doubt it i think there's it's easy to doubt it and when you doubt it you'll fail because you've doubted it not because you weren't good enough or your heart wasn't in the race if that makes sense